continue to pray for Becky. And uh, she gets better and better. And if she wants to stay sick for a few more months, then we could keep Angela. No, I'm going to have to go get her some more. I'm so glad that God brought Angela to sing today. I know she's here to take care of her mom. And, and uh, are, the, are the kids doing a good job, Bobby? Or? Thank you, Lord. They'll figure out what you said. Uh, join me in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 5. The Sermon on the Mount. We're going to uh, look at a familiar few verses this morning. We looked at the Beatitudes last week, and now we'll look at some Besimilitudes. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, verses 16 through 19, uh, covers uh, three different illustrations. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is... Uh, his first sermon as we have recorded in the, the Gospels and Matthew's Gospels full of his teaching, his discourses, teaching on forgiveness, teaching on parables. There's uh, constant teaching. There's miracles that are mentioned, of course. But in the Sermon on the Mount, again, with just these few verses, Jesus Christ says a lot. And uh, when you look at the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, you have to study them properly, study them correctly, study them uh, by the word of God, by the spirit of God to understand that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not the same. They are different. That one is to be fulfilled one day in that physical kingdom and as Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of heaven, and those things that will be on the other side in that physical millennial reign for the audience that is listening to him, which is mainly Jews and also his disciples. We realize also, too, he puts in the middle of there, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Next week we will look beyond this passage into the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and really break down uh, what I believe is really at the core root of this sermon, which is that Jesus Christ is pointing out to the listener that your righteousness, all your righteousnesses, is, 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 are as filthy rags before God, that not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. And he needs to get these people, these religious people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the council, all of these really, really smart by their own thinking people to realize that they're lost and that they need a savior. You see the old phrase that I know I was taught years ago uh, in witnessing to people, I believe still stands true. If a person does not believe they're lost, does not believe that in their own sins they will die and spend eternity in hell, separated from God, and that they need the redemption of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's really, really hard to get any further than the introductory pages. But that doesn't stop you from teaching them about what the Word of God says, teaching them what Jesus Christ is doing here, which is letting them know this is the life that you can have. None of this can be done on your own strength. I need to teach you what the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, me, means. But in order to do that, I need to break you down. I need to break things down for you and help you understand what it means to have a blessed life. And that blessed life, again, is found in me. Jesus Christ is brought to this earth to be that redemption, of course, by his Father. But he appears to these Jews in the Gospel of Matthew, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, so that you get a kind of like a little bit of an introduction in this Matthew's Gospel, that he is the Messiah that's been sent to the nation of Israel. All the prophets before him, all those that are off the lineage of Adam, died. Correct? The first Adam. They all 
died. They're in the flesh. But Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. And when you lay down your life, understand the goodness of God, leadeth thee to repentance, and you understand what the Scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, that when you realize there's no way that you can fulfill a bunch of rules and laws to go to heaven, that is by God's grace that you're saved through Christ, then you get the idea that, oh, if I believe in Jesus Christ, call the name of the Lord to save me. I'm born into his family, and now, guess what? I'm alive forever. In Christ, we live forever. In the first Adam, Adam, you die forever. Again, the old phrase, if you're born once, you die. If you're born twice, you die. There you go. Praise the Lord. She's in agreement. I like that. I like an interactive audience. I do. I do. She's perfect. Just remember that, Mom and Dad, when she gets older. She was perfect for a long time. Jesus pulled his disciples up behind him and around him. And so when you see verse number one, you're reminded, the multitudes, he went up to the mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him. Bobby said that when he was over there in the Holy Land last year, that he was able to get up into the place where the Sermon on the Mount was. Pretty incredible, wasn't it, Bobby, to be able to be up on that mountaintop and to know that all the people around for a long distance could hear what Jesus had to say. They could. They could. They were great. They were great. And here's the point. The people that are closest to him are his disciples. And he's about to declare something about them. He's about to say something to him, to them, that he wants them to grab a handle on. Now, Matthew 4, verse number 19 tells us, Jesus Christ said to Peter and Andrew, then James and John, Come, excuse me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, correct? So now they're fishermen that are going to fish for men. Now, Roger and I differ in something about fishing. He absolutely loves fishing for fish. But we agree in that we love fishing for men as well. So we have an agreement in that area. But fishing, on the other hand, he'd have to school me for a few years, show me all the positives about it, show me how wonderful it is. And then, but guess what? Fishing for men, fishing for men, that's something that we're all supposed to love to do. And Jesus Christ is about to tell you very convictingly what you and I are. He's saying to the disciples and Matthew 5, verse number 13, ye are the salt of the earth for me, for the Lord. You see, he's pointing to them and telling them, like you and me this morning, believers, you're the salt of the earth. This isn't for someone next to you. This isn't for someone over there. When you follow verse number 13, you say, but if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So he says one verse about being salt. Then he says in verse number 14, ye are the light of the world. You're salt of the earth. You are light of the world. Jesus said that of himself, of course, but we're focusing on Jesus saying it to us. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So Jesus spends three verses, three different lines here saying, reemphasizing re about light, whereas he just says what he says about salt, but we're going to cover both of them this morning for a moment. Again, you can, ha you can go look up a hundred messages, a hundred sermons on this passage. This is what God's given us church today. Verse number 15 says, neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. A candlestick very simply is a little bit of a stand that you put the lamp on. The candle is a lamp. It's made out of gold, brass, silver, pottery, and it's filled with what? Very good. Give that person a contract. That was good. So right along with this thinking, we know that this lamp, this light, this candle is supposed to continually beam 
It is not supposed to be put under a bushel. So verse number 16 says this. Excuse me, end of 15 says, And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I believe these could be a couple of missing ingredients for our gospel message that we present. We're told in the Bible that it's against the command of the gospel to find another gospel, so I'm not saying that there's another gospel, but I believe oftentimes we don't just use another gospel, we just proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and it has a couple of missing ingredients. I don't understand why people don't get converted when I tell them about Christ. Are you salt? I don't know why people don't understand that I'm begging them to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Are you the light? Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. This morning I wonder, are those the two missing ingredients of why we walk around, look around, and again, I mention it often, it's a challenge to the pastor more than anybody else. A challenge to me as a man as a person, as a son of God. Why is it that there aren't five baptisms a month, every month? Why are we not giving the gospel to people and seeing the salt of Jesus Christ and his truth, the light of the world in Jesus Christ in us, drawing all men? I will tell you, this morning, that if I'm sitting here with the multitudes and the disciples, you and I together would just look at this thing and go, salt, light, how do I become salt? How am I light? But here we are 2,000 years later, later and we have the Bible. We have the word of God. We had the opportunity to say, okay, Lord Jesus Christ, what are you teaching about salt? What are you teaching about light? Because these missing ingredients, when they're put in the mix, they're the ones that are going to make the difference. I think about all the people that I've had an opportunity to witness to. And I know, you know, when we walk away from those opportunities, we're wondering, why didn't something happen? I want to be the salt of the world, uh, salt of the earth. I want to be the light of the world. I want to lead people to Jesus Christ. Why isn't it happening? Why isn't it happening? Well, how much do I really want it? How much do we really, really want it? Because life in his kingdom sees other people coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior, being born again, and coming into the kingdom of God. Because salt, we understand, does an awful lot of things. This morning, clearly, you know from just looking at the scriptures that the salt that Jesus Christ is referring to, and there's not a lot of verses on it, but the salt that Jesus Christ is referring to is the salt that has savor to it. And when you lose your savor, then it's not effective. Jesus used salt to illustrate the effect of his people, those that are closest to him. Are you effective in your own kingdom? You like your own kingdom, but when it comes to Jesus' kingdom, are you a preservative? Because salt seals the good, it keeps out the impurities. It also cleanses. It cleanses whatever it goes into. It makes a difference in that spiritual atmosphere, in that physical uh, uh, environment. It, it's a cleaner. It makes things more godly. It purifies. It also irritates. Salt can be an irritant. Oh, you just pour, pouring some salt in my wound. Well, I'll tell you what, if you get a bad wound and you pour salt in it, you will expedite the healing, correct? Okay, well, you didn't know that. Well, go look it up. It helps to be able to bring healing why? Because of the reaction and action, it preserves and it cleans, and when it does that, it irritates. Also, too, it is said that blocks of salt are brought to livestock, and those livestock are pushed and, and, and excited and irritated to lick it because they have this craving for it, kind of like you when you take the salt shaker and put it on everything, even if you have high blood pressure. 
There's no one that doesn't like extra salt on their meal. So I'm sorry for those of you who have been diagnosed with high blood pressure, and so you don't put a lot of salt on there, but salt does also, too, make things savory. It pleases, because flu- food can be awful blah without it. Now, I'm not saying go, get, go after church and get yourself uh, uh, McDonald's french fries uh, and put extra salt on them, which some of you now I did like a little, you're going to get McDonald's. There's so much salt in those things. Oh, my goodness, they will give you high blood pressure. But salt cleans and preserves and irritates and is savory. So think in your life what salt does for you. And I ask you spiritually, what are you doing as salt in someone else's life? Well, that's up to somebody else. Because if salt loses its savor, Jesus Christ said it's no good. What about light? Light attracts. Light repels. Light removes one thing for the other, and it also glorifies. It brings glory to the Lord. It says in John's Gospel, John chapter 1, verse number 4, it says that Jesus Christ is declared to be the light by the Gospel of John writer referencing John the Baptist, saying, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, in verse number four of John one. It goes down a little bit further, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist, the same was a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. But he was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, the light of God. So you and I, when we get saved, we are that light. That light attracts. Are you attractive to others in terms of your spiritual life? Jesus Christ is saying, look, you were once a fisher of fish, of fish. Now you are a fisherman of people. And you need to be able to put your rod and reel out with the line dropped out and attract people by the light of God. Light is attractive, but light also repels. As light attracts people, animals, it also repels and exposes those that don't want to be around that light. Some just don't want to be around light. It also does something else. It removes things. It does remove completely darkness, but it also removes other things. It is said that I heard that if you get out in the sunlight, it's good for you. Is it okay if you get out in the sun? For two hours getting baked with your shirt off, not so good. Does that lead to cancer, Doc? Probably a good chance. Sun, light, the light of the sun. It is said that it takes care of those that are going through seasonal depression. It enhances the mood. There are studies that say it relieves the stress. They also have light therapy boxes. It actually removes the bad for good. When my daughter, Victoria, was born and had her high bilirubin count, and it was all messed up. She had to uh, get put in the sun. No, it's low. It, had to, it was high, it was low, whichever it was. It was too high. So they said just put her in the sun. Now, we were in June of 88 in Rochester. Does the sun ever come out in Rochester in June? No, no. So we had to bring her back to the hospital because they bring the light lamps down. What's the point? Light can remove something and put something good in place. Salt and light are good. You don't need an incredible science or history lesson. There's a spiritual application to all this. And it's that the missing ingredients in our delivery of the gospel could be a lot to do with why people aren't getting converted. You say, well, the missing ingredients are our hard attitude, are not being filled with the Spirit, not having a word, the Word of God being down, not being sanctified, not being a good witness, not having all the answers for people. Well, I would ask you to consider this morning for just the next few minutes to be open to the Spirit of God showing you through the Word of God that the salt covers an awful lot. The light covers an awful lot. In the Word of God, you'll find out that the salt 
that is found here that Jesus is saying that we are should be changing this world. We always are looking for people to be difference makers, but what is the difference that we want to make? We would have a different spirit. This is what we desire. We want to see things happen. And we understand that salt is very, very important. As it says there in verse number 13, it's up on the screen here, the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savor, where was shall it be salted? Do you understand what happens when salt loses its savor? Back in biblical times, when salt lost its savor, it was good for nothing. You know what they did with it? Here's a part that some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not. When salt leached out, it no longer had the properties to be able to preserve something and to purify it. Then oftentimes it was used in the mud, clay, straw mix for the roofs that were constructed. And it was added to them because the mud would get wet, then dry out and get wet and dry out. But that no longer savored salt would be able to at least hold together that mud a little bit better so that the roof would stop leaking. Another property that it was used for is what Jesus Christ is teaching here. But to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You know what leached out salt was used years ago for? In biblical times, they used it to pave the dirt on the sidewalks and the roads. And as it would harden up after rain, would bring it, and then it would harden up with the sand and with the, and with the, the clay mixture of the dirt, it would be something that people would walk on. Now, how would you like to be salt that lost its savor today? Is that the way we've become? To be used for something extra in the community, in the society, so that men could trodden down upon us? We are the salt of the earth, Jesus Christ says. So Jesus' sermon says the ingredient you need in the gospel message is the savoriness, the, the savoriness of your words. Do your words come out for the gospel that sound attractive and tasty? Are they words that you use to say, hey, you and I have the ability to bring savor. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, Now thanks be to God which always causeth us a triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in the every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ and in them that are saved and in them that perish to the one we are the savior of death unto death and to the other we're savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? What is it that you and I are missing about being salt, savory salt, with our words in this world? I believe if we really were, why are we always blaming somebody else for people not getting saved? Ye are the salt of the world, of the earth. Why is it that you and I look at things and go, well, I just don't know. This world is such a mess. It's so awful. It's so bad. Do you think it wasn't bad 2,000 years ago when this was written? You think it wasn't bad 600 years ago, 500 years ago, 300 years ago? There is bad cycles of man's degrading life. The human condition is messed up. And God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. We are to be the preservation in the society, yes. But we are not the ones that are going to go across and change everybody. Jesus Christ redeems people. But we can stop the spread of societal corruption. But we cannot redeem the lost. We can't. But what are we doing to spread the salt? Because the salt has lost its savor. You and I are supposed to give the gospel to people. Are we so self-consumed that we have such a, 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 an inherent desire to grab a hold of our kingdom that no one else can come into the kingdom? 
God forbid that I would hold on to my kingdom stuff and my world stuff and not invite others to Jesus Christ. Let me show you how the saviorness of your words can help. Go to Proverbs chapter number 15 real quick. Quick little Bible study. we we'll just, just read these verses real quick and move on to our next thought, which is delight. Watch this though. Proverbs 15, 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? Do you say the right thing at the right time or do you have a bad habit of saying the wrong thing at the right time or the wrong thing at the wrong time? Or just never saying anything, unfortunately. Go to Proverbs 16, verse number 21. As we see that God is showing us it is a matter of our heart tied together with our words. And so we do see where God wants us to have savoriness in our words to give the gospel. It says in verse number 21, the wise in the heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth not learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. Verse 23, the heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Verse 24, pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. I heard that you're going through an awful time. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ can make the difference? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Did you know that going through the heartache and the pain that you're going through in life, that Jesus Christ truly is the answer to everything that you're going through? You say, well, will he cure my cancer? He will give you a cure from the inside out. You say, will I physically lose my cancer? That's not what I said. He'll give you a way to handle your cancer so that you're completely cured when you're born again and you go to glory and cancer's gone forever. That's the words that are savory to someone who's dying and hurting and in pain. One of the hardest things right now in this wicked, evil world is people that somehow, some way, in a place of power have the control to stop me to go sit at the bedside of someone who needs to be talked to and comforted. It's rotten. It's rotten. It's evil. But we'll see it through. Because we need to be salt in this world. So let's be a little bit more salty. A little bit more savory with our words. So that the people that hear our words are attracted to what the word of God has to say. You can look some of those other ones up. It says in Colossians 4 verse 6, it's up on the screen. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Again, you got answers about the economy. You got answers about why things are going on. You, you need to just, we just need to stop. Spending all your conversations on all those things, it can be important, but this is the most important conversation. You are the salt of the earth. And if you're not salting it up, then people are going to die and go to hell, and it won't matter what you think about what's going on. We are to be preservatives in this society that we live in. And we're to go with the preservation of the gospel, not your own opinions. They don't do anything other than open people up to think that Jesus Christ does not save when he does save. And they're going through the same hard stuff in the time that this is written in Matthew's gospel. Think of what it says there in view of light. Ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. He tells you that you are what? Salt. He says that you're light, and then he interjects right here that you're a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Now let me just give you something free of charge. Here you go. I give you little things free of charge all the time. This is free. This building is not the light of the world. What? What? Do you, what? what? Oh my gosh! Oh, throw me off of YouTube. What are you talking about? This building houses you. You're the light of the world. We come together, we're the light of the world. I see light, 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 light. You turn the lights off right now, you're still the light of the world. 
This building houses the light. We're on a hill, but you're the hill that the truth of the word of God and the light of the world is set on. You're that hill. Jesus says you're salt, light, and a hill. How are we doing so far? I wonder sometimes how we've just kind of mixed around. Well, I say that's, that's dispensationally written to the Jews. Watch out, be careful what you say. You may not know much about the Bible as you think you do. Because Jesus Christ is saying to the followers of him, ye are the light of the world, ye are the salt of this earth, and you are the hill. Not a building, yeah, we're a lighthouse maybe, where when we come together we shine. Yes, people know that. We are a place that God has given. We have favor in this community. Praise God. Acts chapter number two tells us that we want to have favor with all people. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. But neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. You're the light of the world. Put it on a, a candlestick and give it light unto all that are in the house. And if you track out house and track out the meaning of it, when you really translate it out, you realize that he's speaking about your house, your place of influence, your place in your community, and where you go. We're the ecclesia. We're the set-aside assembly. Yeah, we're the church, the body of Christ that gathers in a place. Let your light so shine before all men. Thank you right now that you shine. I can see that you shine. Not some of you because you have balding hair and because it shines from the lights that are here. Just kidding. Oh, have a sense of humor. Amen. But you think about this. It says something very powerful here. Let your light so shine before men, comma, that they may see your good works, comma, and glorify your Father, which is heaven. Okay, little English. Take out the comma, the part between the two commas. Let your light so shine before men and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Jesus Christ in you allows you to give glory to the Father in heaven. That they may see your good works. Jesus' sermon is simply saying that the ingredient you need in the gospel message is the glorifying of your works. You and I know. Sometimes we just enjoy having someone tell us we did a good job. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We do that a lot around here. We have ministering hearts things. We have thank you Sundays. We have our ministry fair where we get together and acknowledge what God has done. And that's really, really important. But we're talking about glorifying God and all of that, right? Glorifying the Father with our works. The message of the gospel goes out a lot more powerfully to convert the soul when we allow God to say, hey, you are giving me the glory that I deserve. Thank you for the glory. We, are, we the person of the Lord in us, is a city on a hill. This is even more so if you want to be messianic in your prophecy, God is going to lift that Zion hill up in the Lord Jesus Christ and his rule and reign. But that being aside, you and I are already in the kingdom of God. We are the light of the world. You ought to be really excited about that. Stop allowing this world's struggles to take your light away. Well, you don't understand what, you're, what I'm going through. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You're the light of the world. The world needs to see Jesus Christ in you, glorying his Father in the works of the Lord. A couple of quick verses, and we'll finish this up. Go to Philippians 2. You can write those other ones down and take a peek later. Philippians 2 is one that we want to hit on, and then I'm going to put another up there and be finished. Philippians chapter number 2. Think of this. Think of what you're, hey, well, this was, this is, you know, just a salt and light thing. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, don't you want your witnessing to be effective? Don't you want people to really, really believe what you're saying about Jesus Christ? Well, when the salt has lost its savor, 
or the light has been put under a bushel, you and I, but I know there's so many of you, you've told me testimony after testimony, I love what you're doing. I love that you're the salt of the earth. I love that you're taking the principle in the word of God. By the way, this is the living word of God. You as a believer can fulfill all that's in here because of what the Holy Spirit has given you by the word of God. This is something that is being put before the disciples, is being put, to get, put before them in this Sermon on the Mount. You and I go, wait a minute, I got this. Paul writes in Philippians chapter number two, verse number 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. That's who you are, that's who I am, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Yes, this was written almost 2,000 years ago. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Woo! Verse 16, because it doesn't end there holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Your works in the Lord are not for vanity. They are not for nothing. They are to glorify him, glorying in him. This is the glory of the heavenly father. John 14 talks about it. John 50, Jesus Christ is telling his disciples about giving glory to the father in heaven. This is, this is it, Revelation 4. They, they're around that throne, giving glory to him night and day. That's the glory of the Father that we have an opportunity as the light of the world in our gospel message to do. The night is far spent, it says in Romans 13. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It's an incredible study. If you want to spend two or three years on this study, I did a study on light about 20 years ago. It's, exha it's inexhaustive. You can't do it. It's just so much in the Bible about the light of God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that puts us back to giving glory to him for all the works that he allows us to do. The armor of light Think of this as I finish out. What is the missing ingredient in your gospel witness? We are told by Jesus that we are the salt and the light. Think of Paul the apostle before Agrippa and before every time that he had to witness. The mob in Jerusalem in Acts 22, Felix and Festus, and then of course Agrippa in Acts 26. And what does he say there? What does he tell him? I don't know what, ha what I, I know what I was before. Something happened to me, and this is who I am now. And he says to Agrippa in Acts 26, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when they were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, what art thou, Lord? who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. I am the light of the world, Jesus is telling him. And as Paul gives his account to Agrippa, he says in verse number 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. People are in darkness. People are in darkness. And from the power of Satan unto God, people are captured by Satan that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The salt of the earth and the light of the world. Paul was that example for you and for me. We are told by Jesus that we are the salt and the light. Those missing ingredients you and I need to get a handle on. What is the missing ingredient in your gospel witness? Would you please bow for a word of prayer? Now, I want your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take about one minute and read an old hymn for our invitation hymn. If you wanna come forward and do business with the Lord, that's great. What is the missing ingredient in your gospel witness? I want you to listen to this. Send the light, the gospel light, let us shine from shore to shore. 
Send the light and let its radiant beams light the world forevermore. An old song written in 1888 by a man, Charles Gabriel. Send the light, the gospel light. Let me read it to you while you pray. There's a call comes ringing over the restless wave. Restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light, send the light. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light. And a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. Our Father in heaven, we come to you with a great need upon our hearts. We thank you for sending the light, the gospel light, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the light of the world that lighteth all men. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit awakening us to the truth of what you're telling us. I don't want my salt to become unsavory. I don't want my light from you to be put under a bushel. I pray this morning for your church, stir us, awaken us, that we may be the ones that you send as we send the light, the gospel light, and that we become the salt in our communities that we live in. Thank you for our morning in your word. Thank you for your blessed salvation. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. amen.